James Schilling Law for virtual road shows, selling adventure and expedition travel. And I'm also editor in chief of Insider Travel Report. We're here today for a panel on how to sell adventure travel, adventure tours in the market today. And we have a great, uh, great uh, panel here. And let let's me introduce them first, and they will raise their hand as I mention them. Uh, from Exodus Adventure Travels, we have Wendy Mills. Okay, welcome, Wendy. Hello. From Colette, we have Ryan Grissett. Hello, Hi, Ryan. James. He's been on before. From uh, Big Five Tours and Expeditions, Ashish Sangrajka. Hi guys. I think I got that one right. I, I'm always you got it right. Um, mm-hmm. And I've known known Ashish for a while from Emerging Destinations. Uh, Jane Barrand. Hi everyone. And last but not least, from Ultimate Jet Vacations, Simon Jones. Hi guys. Okay, Pleasure so we're going to get right to it, and uh, then of course when we're done, uh, you can all go down to the uh, virtual sh- trade show floor and all of these folks have booths down there and you can converse more with them and also their uh, sales managers and sales development people. So let's uh, let's talk about this for a little while. First of all, I want to get each of you to briefly describe your company. Let's start with you, Simon. Uh, what is your company? Thanks uh, very much, James. Hi again, guys. So yeah, Ultimate Jet Vacations um, is, if, if some of you don't know, predominantly was Caribbean and Mexico. Uh, the company is a luxury wholesaler that kind of serviced those two main areas. And then uh, when the dreaded COVID entered in 2020, they kind of looked at branching out to different areas. And uh, I guess luckily enough for me, Africa came to the forefront there and uh, yeah, bounce forward three years later, we have a full operating Africa division here at UJV. Um, and uh, yeah, the again, we, we, we try to focus on sort of um, high end luxury. Uh, and yeah, adventure has definitely crept in over the last sort of couple of years with people looking at doing a lot more nowadays than your cookie cutter sort of style itineraries. Um, so yeah, that's uh, okay. in a quick uh, nutshell. Okay, so that's great. And uh, Ryan, uh, Colette, uh, we know Colette is kind of, uh, you, you go all around the world, but you also do, do focus on some adventure travel as well, right? Yes, sir, James, good to see you again. Um, yeah, we're a four-star land operator based in, in Rhode Island. Uh, our tours uh, hit all seven continents. They range from five up to 30 days. And uh, we've made a real focus of, of adding some adventure elements uh, over the last couple of years. I've been here 14 years, and it's a lot more adventurous than it was um, 14 years ago. So we're we're uh, we're glad to offer the world to to folks. And uh, let's move over to Big Five Tours. My friend Ashish, uh, tell us a little bit about Big Five, Ashish. Sure. Well, uh, Big Five Tours Expeditions is uh, 51 years old in a week. Um, so we just celebrated our 50th anniversary last year. I'm second generation from Africa as well. And, uh, literally as this show is going on, I'll be out with a primatologist in the Southern parts of Buindi jungle, uh, Buindi forest with gorillas and whatnot. So nothing defines adventure for big five more than going up a Via Ferrata to a room that's hanging off the side of a cliff in Peru or going gorilla trekking with primatologists or basically doing anything with your hair on fire 100 miles an hour. <laughs> uh, it's essentially, you know, it is travel 2.0, uh, but, uh, but I, I have to stress that we're a conservation company first. So as much as we are adventure, uh, our, our foundation leads the charge through artificial intelligence and what we do and actually being able to uh, bring help around the world through some of the most creative itineraries. Fantastic. Now, Jane, talk a little bit about what emerging destinations. You, you re- represent not only tour operators, but also destinations, right? Yeah, actually, we represent destinations, uh, DMCs, hotels and lodges around the world. So um, basically, our mission statement is saving wild places through travel. Every one of these tour operators at some point has booked with some of our clients. So the best way to book is through your preferred tour operator. And I just returned from yesterday, I guess, from um, I was two week, I was a month in Chile and Bolivia. So everything from where I got splattered by a geyser because I got too close because there were no fences in Bolivia. Ah. Um, Luckily, it just got my pants. (laughs) And um, to um, sleeping on, you know, uh, is, on, on Sun Island and uh, 
and trekking in Patagonia on this last trip. So we do off the beaten track destinations and of course, some of your more traditional because adventure to some people is going to be at a private game reserve somewhere in South Africa or in Kenya. So it all depends on what adventure means to you. Okay, great. Now let's let's really drill down, focus on specifically adventure. Uh, and already we see some, in some cases adventure is not the only focus of your companies. Uh, but let's let's talk about the adventure part. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Simon. Uh, what would you say are the adventure type of trips that you you book? Uh, and and that our travel advisors can book through you. Yeah, and and I think the main thing there is that the only program we focus on, no. But what was happening uh, over the last few years again uh, is is people want to do more when they go to Africa. You know, Africa in the past used to kind of be go visit, and we use Cape Town as an Cape Town as an example. Do one or two tours, hit safari, and come home. And as Ashish mentioned there. You know, now we've opened up the, the the likes of gorilla tracking, and you know, we we really want to showcase, and I, I use Africa specifically as a destination. So, you know, now you take these multi gen families, and you know, they've got kids involved. So, what can we do to keep the kids entertained? Safari is always going to be an adventure in itself, but what can we do? You know when it comes to getting into areas like Cape Town as an example. So obviously hiking up Table Mountain now is kind of something that's become quite mm-hmm. popular and kind of branching out to, 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 to other areas to really explore the destination. Because one thing that I always tell people is that, you know, you, you get quite blindsided when, when, when it comes to certain parts of Africa. And we want to broaden those kind of, you know, your, your mind when going there. So, for example, zip lining for families uh, up in the kind of Kirsten Bosch area has become very popular. Again, back to gorilla tracking. We did so much gorilla tracking last year. It was kind of one of our, our top selling destinations. Mm-hmm. So when it when it comes to, and again, especially Africa now, nowadays, you don't just have to, you, you know, again, stick to that cookie cutter style itinerary. We 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 want to show you that there's so much to do in these areas, and uh, yeah, that's what we try showcase when we sell Africa. Fantastic! Sounds like that, and I actually have done a rappelling down Table Mountain, yeah. so I I know Popular. that years ago. Uh, it was very exciting and very uh, um, scary, actually. But yeah, and, and, and you take paragliding as an example of Signal Hill, another one that's become, you know, one, one of these things where people are brave enough to kind of do it. So, you know, Africa has a little bit of everything. So that's the great thing about it. Now, let me move over to Wendy at Exodus. You actually have adventure in your, I think you just added that in your name in the past year. Yes. Because that you have yes. been focusing on that. But So that is your focus. Uh, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how you cater to the adventure traveler. Right. So we are adventure travelers. We've been doing this for 50 50- years. Years almost as long. Oh, we got we got a lot of fifty years old going. Year. Out. Oh, Paulette's going to come in and tell you they're a hundred years. So careful. <laughs> <laughs> Um, But we take adventure travel a little bit different. We focus on the active side of adventure travel. So our trips are going to be walking, trekking, hiking based, but also biking, cycling trips. So Mm -hmm. when we do our cycling trips, we get you off the beaten path. Of course, we try to get you in with the locals to get the authentic feel. Our groups are small, only 16 people when you travel with us. Everybody gets to know each other. It's very small and very quaint, very welcoming. And it's a good range for all ages. I mean, our average age on our trips is actually around 62. Um, But we travel from 18 and above. Everybody's welcome to travel with us. We have different fitness levels. So that way, you know, when your client is getting ready to go on these hikes or treks or cycling trips, that they are ready to to challenge that. Um, A lot of people I find this year now have been really kind of getting into the bucket list trip items and really wanting to have some kind of sense of accomplishment. So I really feel like our trips really do work towards that. We've had people that have booked cycling trips and they're like, oh, now we've got to get to the gym and get on the spin bike and get training for this trip. So it really is a great option for adventure travelers um, to get out and see and to do something different, really give you a sense of accomplishment when you travel. No, absolutely. And, and, and that's what I like about adventure travel. Now, Ryan, uh, you, we know you're a broader tour operator, but in, in terms of adventure, how do you cater to adventure travelers? And as I did say, you're already, you guys are a hundred years old. So, you know, 106, uh, 106. Oh my God. I, I'm, I'm, I'm making you younger than you sound. <laughs> that's right. Um, no, I, I think it's, I actually thought Jane brought up a very good point. And it's something we've been talking about internally. And, and I think Jane said, it's what does adventure mean to you? And, 
I think she hits the nail on the head. We're a guided tour operator. And to Wendy's point, our demographic is, is pay, folks that are near retirement are already into retirement. So, you know, our adventure, I, I think our product department does an amazing job designing for our demographic. You know, examples would be zip lining in Costa Rica. Um, another example would be uh, dog sledding in Finland uh, or t- riding tuk-tuks in, in parts of Asia. Um, that's somewhat of the adventure that we're catering to our de- demographic. And again, I think our product department does due diligence through, you know, receiving customer experience back from the folks that travel with us and building that into our tours. So that's, that's how we, we're tackling adventure. And it's, it's going to be built and centered around the folks that are in our demographic. Absolutely. Now, Ashish, uh, talk a little bit about how you cater. Obviously, you are really focused on adventure, but how do you cater to adventure travelers? And and uh, it is your main focus, right? Yeah, it, look, it is. Um, well, you said conservation as well, but that's another. Story. Well, and, and it, they go hand in hand, uh, yeah. you know, in terms of us. So I'll tell you. So for us, pur- purpose driven adventure are, are, are some of the key tenants. So, I mean, they're part of our charter. So we, we firmly believe that adventure, travel, authenticity, sustainability all meet at the same place when done correctly. Um, I, I have a mathematical equation that I use frequently to 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 talk about the power of, of adventure travel. I'm a member of the World Travel Tourism Council, and we talk about it here. The fact that uh, you know. D- when tourism, especially when it comes to any kind of sustainable travel, adventure travel makes up at least 10% of a country's GDP, there's a direct correlation to political and economic stability. I'm, I'm a testament to this. My, I'm, a, I'm a son of a refugee from Sudan, um, you know, and I've seen this firsthand in that sense. Now, when, when you look at this, there's a couple of examples of where this blends itself. So, for example, uh, last May or last June, we were the first company to lead a group through an area of Colombia called Caño Cristales. Now, everybody's been out here, but the way we did this is a day trip where you land and you actually go in. And this place is the Rainbow River. This is where the river is multiple colors. There's oil carpets underneath here as well that haven't been drilled, but you literally have to get off the plane. You then have to ride in the back of a pickup truck to a dugout canoe, then hike. And then before you jump into the water here, you cannot have worn any sunblock. You cannot have worn any kind of mosquito repellent. You basically have to wear in layers and jump in, then jump back out to keep the water pristine. And the, and the reason it's called Rainbow River is because the algae underneath it is luminescent and changes color with the sunlight. Now, while you're here, the guides that you talk to here, most of these guys were mules for the cartels when they were kids. <laughs> One particular guy that I that we work with at five years old, his parents were strapping kilo bags to his legs and putting putting his pant legs over it and driving him across the border. And now he's working in tourism. So there's a transformation that occurs. You know, you take Rwanda, you take Uganda, you take any other in any part of the African continent, and you're dealing with transformation. So for us, adventure travel, yes, it's about all the active stuff, the hiking, the trekking. The, as I said doing something crazy, you know, with your hair on fire at 100 miles an hour. Um, if, if you can jump off something, I've done it. Um, and so we do that for clients. My drive my insurance company crazy when I talk about these things. Uh, but, but, it, but it's a sense that you're, you're actually able to show transformation in a country. And even the people that are traveling, they enter the country as one person. They leave as somebody else. Well, it sounds like they drive my insurance company crazy if I try if I go on one of your trips as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we've just we we've we, talked we, about that too. So I, I'm we, perfectly we well. We won't tell them. We yeah. won't tell them. Just just okay. We Don't tell them. them. It's, it's our secret, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, Jane, talk a little bit about and you do a lot of different things with this, but talk about how specifically you cater to the adventure traveler uh, and what you what you do well one of one of my goals is is because you know a lot of people can do the the luxury and add the adventure on i also want agents to know that they can actually make money on doing things like selling the w trek mm-hmm. uh the second most popular trek in chile and around torres de Paine national park that you can do camping um you can you can do a a, a month long class in South Africa where you do a mini guide training and you may be sleeping in tents. It's very basic. It's one kind of like Girl Scout camp food, though. I did their program. I did a program in South in Kenya that was unbelievable food, but that you can do these programs that they're very affordable, 150 to $200 a night and they're commissionable to agents. Right. You want 
to get rid of your 18 year old for a year, send him to a guide training course. I, I know when I was, when my kids were 17, I wanted to get rid of them. <laughs> they make you ready for college. But my daughter, for instance, did one of these courses for 12 weeks and came back a different person uh, right. living out in the bush, handling, by building roads, all different kinds of things, helping, helping a vet do um, surgery. And now she's in veterinary school. So these are things that are available through your tour operators or, you know, however you want to do it. But I think a lot of agents think that they can't they can't um, sell it or they that it, there's not a market and there's a huge market for it. Absolutely. I totally agree. And one so, of the reasons we have this show is that uh, even though I think it's been over 10 years where travel advisors figured out. And the, the, the companies you see here are actually working with travel advisors all the time. Uh, but, you know, their adventure travel operators were generally small companies that may not have worked with travel advisors. So I, mm -hmm. I have an interview here that's featured with Shannon Stoll of the uh, ATTA, the Adventure Travel Trade Association. And I said to him, you know, a few years ago, um, it, it seems like 10, and I'm getting old, so I, I may have lost a decade, that people would be uh, really adverse to, to going and working with adventure tour operators because they think, well, they didn't pay commission, uh, they wouldn't make any money. But now adventure travel, because of the things that have happened in the world, is really kind of all the rage. So I think you're absolutely right. It, that this is a way. It, it is. It is. And the other thing is, is if you can get people there young enough, you know, at, at 20 years old, what you can afford is very different what you can afford when you're 60. Right. If you can get them, say, to the Galapagos, that Galapagos client uh, it, on a budget trip to Galapagos, that Galapagos client is eventually at, at some point, a lot of them are going to be a luxury African safari client. Absolutely. Um, as as they get older. So I just I want agents to think about that and think, uh, how do I bring up clients um, a, as they start making more money and uh, in their savings increase? Well, uh, Jane, let's stick with you. And then we're going to go sort of back across the panel. And I just really want to, each of you to tell me the kind of destinations, adventure travel destinations that you sell. Uh, uh, what the ones you were really focused on, and maybe there's a, a lot of them, but uh, Jane, what, what are the ones that you kind of come to mind that, you, that work, you, you work with? I got a long list. Um, uh, mountain Gorilla Trekking. I've been selling it since 2002. Um, so Rwanda, the, Uganda, that kind Rwanda, of thing? Rwanda, Uganda. Uganda. Um, I've been into the DRC, but I wasn't, I got in trouble for doing that. Um, we've, um, the Galapagos Islands, uh, it, it land, land-based and, um, small yacht based, um, Torres de Pine National Park, um, staying at a lodge or going camping, uh, staying in hostels. Uh, I just got back from, um, the Uni Salt Flat. That's where I've got a beautiful salt hotel that I'm working with there. Uh, so guide training programs in Southern Africa. We've we've got a little bit of everything, including and then if you want to do luxury in Panama, where you can your your adventure is going off on a on a yacht for the day. We can do that, too. So, okay, let, Wendy, let's shift over to you. I mean, most you're selling all your destinations. What were your main destinations for Exodus? Yes. Yeah, so we are all over the world. So we have over over 600 itineraries in 100 countries. So we're everywhere. But our top selling destinations are more of the European region. We do a lot of Italy, a lot of walking and wine, Tuscany. Um, we also do a lot of, when we do our walks and our hikes, we start you off in the major cities, but then we get you away. We take you out to the authentic towns. You meet the locals. We always stay in um, hotels that are from the area. We don't say any chain hotels as well. So Italy has been probably our number one. Portugal, of course, Greece as well, but some up and coming areas for us, of course, has been Morocco, um, Vietnam, um, and people that have, you know, really been behind me, I have Croatia. So if you've already been yeah. to Croatia and you've seen it, we have some really great alternate. We're doing Bosnia and Herzegovina. We're doing Albania, the Silk Roads. Um, we have, we just launched Georgia, the Baltics. We have some really unique 
destinations that people haven't been to before, or, you know, if they liked Croatia and they want to try something similar, but a different area, we definitely do have that for them. Um, we've also just been certified B Corp as well, our organization, which is really great. So we work sustainability as our number one. We make sure that where you travel, it goes back into the local communities. We use local guides, local hotels, local restaurants, everything is local on the ground. So it is really wonderful, but really we have something for everybody. And like I mentioned, we do different fitness levels. So, you know, if you're looking for a leisurely pace or you're looking to hike Everest base camp, you know, we, we do have that for you as well. So a little bit of everything. So, so sort of more traditional adventure destinations, but also other destinations that you can see in a new, in a new way. Uh, so that in a new way. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Simon, you, you really are focused on Africa or do you do more than that? Yeah, well, well, me specifically, yes, I head up the Africa team, uh, James. But yeah, the company itself, UJV, uh, has divisions in Europe. Uh, again, like I mentioned at the Stock Crib in Mexico. But when it comes to adventure travel, there's nothing better than Africa. Uh, I'm very biased in that statement, but I'm going to stick to it. And, uh, you know, we focus on areas like Tanzania. We've just wrapped up a Kilimanjaro trip. One of the guys within the team, he's done it three times, twice by himself and once with his dad. Um, walking safaris. I don't think there's anything that can kind of really get the the, the, the rush going, walking through the African bush and, uh, you know, trekking on foot is, is just amazing. And there's a, uh, Miss Jane Barron said there uh, a while back, gorilla tracking. I tell you, that is for me one of the most amazing mm -hmm. kind of adventures mm -hmm. that you can embark on. It really has become something now that is the top of a bucket list. Africa always used to be a bucket list item, but a lot of people are going back more and more now. But that gorilla track, I can tell you, has become so popular and it's just an experience that you can't explain. And yeah. um, you know, I try and encourage everyone to kind of, if they, you know, if, if they are going to head over to that part of the world, tracking, you know, the, the, that amazing um, primate is something special. So, yeah, definitely full focus on Africa when it comes to the adventure side. Yeah, I missed out on, I did not go to the World Travel and Tourism Council last year, which was in Rwanda. And unfortunately, I missed out on that. But I'll have to get back there one of these days. Uh, now, Just Ryan, to let any of us know. Okay. Ryan, Ryan, what are kind of your adventure travel destinations where you kind of, that, that's, that's what you're really focused on. I, I would say that, you know, we have a small group tours called a product line called explorations. And I would say that those tend to be more adventurous for our demographic than, than some of our other product lines. Um, I alluded a little bit earlier to Finland where they're, they're standing in the glass igloos that you see on all the Finland marketing. And then they're, from there, we're doing dog sledding and we're doing some different activities that are, quite frankly, for, for the folks that travel with us, extremely adventurous. A um, couple other play, I, I, Costa Rica, I, I want to touch on yeah. um, Costa Rica, I think is one of those places that is extremely adventurous. Um, we do, we stay in an eco lodge in our small group tour out on the, um, on the east coast of Costa Rica and do some river safaris, which I think are, are I, I did it in 2014 and thought they were absolutely amazing. It's like being inside of a zoo, just similar to what Simon just talked about with Africa. I mean, we have some small groups to Africa as well uh, that are extremely adventurous. And then just to round it out, two things, you know, Antarctica is one that we get um, towards the, the end of every year, Q4 and Q1, where we're going to Antarctica and people are, are, are hitting their seventh con continent typically with us uh, and are, they're feeling adventurous enough to go to Antarctica. And then finally, um, we're doing a small, we have a, a little bit of a private yacht that we're doing in Croatia. We have two in Croatia and one coming soon in Greece um, where it's a maximum of 35 people and it's Croatian and its islands. It'll be Greece and its islands, but they're staying on that yacht and able to do things that they wouldn't necessarily be able to do on our land tour. So I think those are a couple of examples um, they're quite adventurous for us. Absolutely. No. And those yachts sounds great. Absolutely. And, and Antarctica, I assume you work with another vendor to uh, provide the Antarctica cruises, right? We do. We've worked with her degree in the past and, and they're, they've been fantastic. So we work with a couple of vendors yeah, because we're a land operator. So anything, um, including what I just alluded to with, with Croatia, it's going to be with a, with a, a cruise line we partner with. Got it. Got it. And Ashish, I know, uh, give us a lineup of your destinations. I know most of them, I think. Yeah, you, you got a pretty good handle of them. You know, it, it's funny. This is a great question because when you talk about the adventure, we just every beginning of every year, we put together a collection, a video collection of our emerging destinations. And 
What was really good to see is the normals were there, but Sri Lanka popped up on, on our list because right. we've been seeing a growth there. And, and that's a place that I've really been after uh, for some time. But this, it's interesting because when you look at some of the things that we do, as I mentioned to you, you know, just like Jane was saying, we go off the beaten track. But we call it Travel 2.0. Um, it's basically where you're comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, so an element of it, for example, uh, was going out to northern Peru, way, way out to, a t- to an area called the Iescas Peninsula. This is 900 miles off the coast of Galapagos. A uh, funny story here is I got to actually uh, message Toyota because I was trying out a new trail to get people in to see if we could get people into this area. We ended up cracking the axle in the back of our Toyota Hilux. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a message to Toyota saying, dear Toyota engineers, do better. That was basically it. Uh, but, but, but I mean, places like this where the Galapagos sea lions, the humble penguins migrate from the Galapagos to here. There's only one hotel with four rooms was for 70,000 acres, as an example. Uh, right. If we come into, let's say, for example, Gokta, you know, 30% of our business is family travel. We're family travel certified by the Family Travel Association. And, you know, when you come out here, the fact that, you know, Gokta is the waterfall that was in the movie Up. That was with modeled after. It's the fifth highest freestanding waterfall in the world. You'd never know it was there because everybody focuses on Machu Picchu. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that was a part of it as well. When we come into Egypt, I just got back from Egypt. And one of the things that we're doing, you know, it's a place, again, my my wife's family is from Uganda. My my mother's from Sudan. So I got to be entrenched here. But one of the things we've done here is working with local archaeologists here. I've never been a big fan of the big brand name archaeologists. So Mm -hmm. working with local archaeologists here because our country manager went to school with a lot of them. We now have access to the newest discoveries. The group that was with me in December, I was lowering down a mine shaft and a rope pulley into a chamber that had 97 sarcophagi and three mummies still in there. It was just discovered two months ago. Um, You know, like Indiana Jones, man. Oh, uh, he's got nothing on me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that part of it, but then also going up, and for example, in Tanzania, you know, Jen and I talk a lot about East Africa and the fact that I'm second generation from there. I spent a lot of time in Southern Tanzania, places like Ruaha, which I call the new, the new Serengeti, um, you know, areas that, that most people don't know even exist. Right. right, we, right. we get this, we got this, this system in our head that we have to go here, 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 here. But what about everything else? So I mentioned Sri Lanka. The part that I'm really excited about is, you know, three areas. One is Colombia, because I've been there now. This year will have been 42 times I've been to Colombia. Right. I know you do a lot. Uh, of that. Yeah. We were the first company in 06 to open up there. We have our own office there. And so getting into more of the remote areas of Colombia, like Caño Cristales, and developing more into Los Llanos and places like that. But even coming down into places like Japan, we purposely suspended Japan post-pandemic. We didn't start it because mm-hmm. of how overwhelmed it was, right? So, you know, you, 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 we talked about sustainability. There were 2,300 guys in Japan before the pandemic. Now there's 900. Mm-hmm. So being able to, to control that properly. So we're starting Japan now for the first time post-pandemic, May onwards. And for us, Japan is not Tokyo and Kyoto. It's the Kamano Kodo. It's the multi-day treks. It's the stuff that gets you out of the vehicle into more active adventures while making a difference on the ground. No, that's great, and I know you have some very exotic places. Now, uh, Ryan, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about what t- typically takes place during one of your more adventure-oriented trips. What do your guests do? I think, uh, I mean, typically on on ours, we same thing. We have a rating system on on you know how exerting it's going to be. It's one through four. Um, we do walking tours. We're doing obviously we're based on having motor coaches, but we've been. I think the key from an adventure standpoint, we've been looking at different forms of transportation over the last couple of years to make it a little bit more adventurous, right. um, whether it's a boating aspect, it's a train aspect, or maybe it's, it's uh, smaller vehicles in, in Africa. We use four by fours and with some of our safari products. So I think that's from an adventure standpoint, that's probably where we're trying to change it up a little bit as far as guided tour goes, James. Absolutely. So it does differ a bit from your regular guided tour business. Would you say I, I would say the ones that are more adventurous are definitely, or we're, we're shifting from and, and adding some other elements that we might not in our, our, our classic tours. Okay. Uh, and Ashish, let's go back to you. Uh, you've already talked a little bit about what sort of goes on during one of your adventure trips, but give me a, a, a typical uh, adventure trip and what you one of them that you one of your favorites that, and what, what goes on during that trip? Well, my favorite one is is one I did recently, which was actually to Guatemala. 
Uh, and that's one that I, I love going to. I went to school in Tucson, so I was, you know, just an hour from the border of Mexico. So I became fluent in Spanish pretty quickly. Wow. Um, but coming down to, to Guatemala, one of the things, you know, there's, there's 32 volcanoes in Guatemala, three that are active, uh, and two of the active three are right around Antigua. So, uh, one of the coolest things is actually Pacaya volcano, the, the lava tunnel, the lava caldera is aimed south. So it's an angled caldera that comes down, the lava flows down one side. So we start in the morning and you actually climb, hike up Akitanango, which is a volcano that's dormant. And we're looking over Fuego, which erupts every half an hour. And that's just a, a, a smoke, not much lava right now. And so you're looking down on this eruption happening every 30 minutes while you're having breakfast. Um, and then as you come down to Pacaya, we get there later in the day, and that's where we go down the south side, and we have a, a custom grill built over the lava, and we have a guest chef with an ATV that comes up and cooks pizza over the lava for you. It is the best tasting pizza I've ever had in my life. I got to tell, I got to tell you. Lava at that pizza. Point, now that, that's oh, a product. Yeah. <laughs> I had, I had my, my, my kids and my family saw and say, what if the lava gets you? I said, if you drink enough beer, you won't care. It'll be all right. But it was actually, there's a, there's a ravine that goes down. So you're never in danger. But it's it brought me back to my childhood. I was you know 14 years old in Costa Rica. And we got so close to Iron Isle Volcano when it was erupting. And one of the lava... I guess the ash pieces landed on my camera and burnt a hole right through the lens. So I have no <laughs> proof of it. So oh, that's this, is taking, this is taking me back to that saying, look, I, I, you know, this is, this is a cool experience. So stuff like that, where, as I mentioned, people are looking to give back, but are looking to get out of the comfort zone and become comfortable being uncomfortable. Absolutely. Now, uh, Jane, same question. Uh, uh, what sort of, from your experience typically takes place during an adventure trip and what do the guests do? Okay. Yeah, so um, I'm going to use, I, I represent the country of Guyana, and um, I'm going to use a, a trip that I did that I would do in a second again, um, because it really tested me. Um, I went out camping with a guy named Ashley Holland, who actually grew up in Botswana. His mother was one of the first women guides there, ended up wanting to do something different. So he ended up in, in Guyana, growing up in Guyana. And um, I went out camping with him for four days in the wilderness. We did not see another human being once we left the small town that we were in, um, but we did see lots of wildlife like otters and, um, but we camping, sleeping in hammocks, sl bathing in the river. And guess what I got to see all you birders? Harpy eagles. So, which if you're a birder is really a big deal, guys. So, um, but to know that, you know, I think at the last time I did it, I was in my late fifties. Now I'm 60, um, that, that I could still do that, mm -hmm. that I could still go camping. I could sleep comfortably in a hammock so much so that I brought, bought one of their hammocks and can sleep in it here. You just have to know how to sleep in it properly <laughs> and, and to, to, to bathe in the river, um, and not see another human being other than your small group. I mean, that's that's a real privilege. And to me, that was real adventure. And uh, I will do that anytime Ashley wants to take me on a, and my husband on a big fishing trip across Guyana, where you sort of fish all these areas. And um, th that's what I want to do next. That sounds exciting. I, I, I'll, that'd be, mm -hmm. I, I can't decide whether that's more exciting than getting a, uh, uh, pizza cooked over lava. So this is, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> um, uh, Wendy, same thing about get, take, take one of your typical Exodus trips and what, what does the client experience? What, what, uh, what takes place during these trips? Of course. Yeah. Everyone is different for sure. Um, but even when you do our walking trips, we designed our trips to most of them usually do start from your accommodation. So you mm -hmm. get up in the morning, you have your breakfast, every but he meets as a group and then we take off on our trails or our treks. Then we have lunch somewhere in between. And then we're usually back to our next accommodations around mid afternoon. So we have some free time to just you know, take a nap or, you know, go look around, explore on your own for sure. And then we get together as a group in the evening, have our meal. Everybody talks about the day and it really is a nice kind of group setting for, for traveling. But even with our cycling trips, you have vehicle support. So you'll mm -hmm. have a guide with you on the ground but you also have a vehicle behind you. So it's great for somebody that, you know, they'll ask me, they're like, oh, what if one day I just don't want to cycle today? And 
Well, you can just jump in the van and follow the group that's with you. It's no problem okay. at all. And that's what it's there for. I recently returned from our Vietnam and Cambodia trip and it was absolutely amazing. So what we do with that one is we started in Hanoi. It was a crazy busy city, but then we got out of there the next day and went out to Hao Long Bay and we stayed one night on a beautiful boat. Very relaxing, very peaceful. Then we continued down to Hoi An, again, a nice, quiet little town. You can walk around, uh, lots to see and do in that area, of course. And then we continued down to um, Ho Chi Minh, Saigon City. We went through the history, of course, of the Chui Chui Tunnels, um, where the Viet Cong were living. Yeah. And this beautiful kind of, you know, tunnel system that it was, I didn't even realize it was amazing just to learn the history. But the cool thing that I really liked, we flew over to Siem Reap. We were up at three in the morning to go out to Angkor Wat and mm -hmm. it was pitch black. Everybody was like, why are we doing this? But we got to watch the sunrise up over the beautiful oh, yeah. Angkor Wat. It was absolutely, we got there before the main crowds. We were first in line. It was just something that will stay in my mind forever. It's just something that not a lot of people will do, but it was just amazing to see that. And, uh, you know, it, it really does every, every, you know, trip is different, but the thing is, well, our leaders are very flexible. When we were in Hoi An, we said, you know, we, we would like to go and do this riverboat cruise as well. And uh, the guide, he arranged it for us. All of us went and it was great. So it really is a flexible itinerary to go and see things when you're in the city. Um, but it really does give some downtime and flexibility as well. Well, that's great. I, I I was lucky enough to go to Myanmar and see the temples there, at, and we had to wake up at three in the morning to see the sun. Yeah. Uh, I that that's when you could still go to Myanmar. Uh, I don't think that might have closed out again. But uh, Simon, yeah, uh, it's the, amazing. The, the typical tour for your company. What what yeah. what, what what happens during that? As as Wendy said, everything's different, Charles, because we 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 tailor make and we we kind of pick the client's brain in the beginning because again, gone are those days where. You just stick to that. Again, I use the word cookie cutter style itinerary. So whether it's a bicycle tour through Soweto uh, on one or two days in Johannesburg or horseback riding uh, up in Shiula Hills, uh, Oldonio Lodge, um, you know, there's so many things now that you can do in Africa. So we try to pull that information from, from the onset. And for, for, for me now, we've gone as far as partnering with sort of companies in using Cape Town as an example that fully focus on adventure so that when they get picked up in the morning, whether it's a surfing lesson, whether it's again, zip lining or, you know, canoeing uh, up past um, Seal Island, there's all these things that you can do now. So again, with us not having set packages, when we do our kind of introduction call with the agent, et cetera, we kind of really help them pick that client's brain so that when it comes to it, what do you like doing? What is your passion? Et cetera, et cetera. So again, we, we can tick all those boxes when they go to, to the continent. Absolutely. No, that's great. And uh, let me, let me go back to you, Wendy, and we're going to talk a little bit. I don't know if you have any estimation of how the large the adventure travel market is today. Uh, I, I know there are different organizations that have that kind of stat, uh, but I, or whether your company has done some kind of assessment of that. And the, the other, the second question is, uh, who are your travelers? What's the, the demographic and who's going? Yeah. So, I mean, adventure travel is growing so, so much. I mean, people used to think adventure travel was Indiana Jones, you know, scaling mountains, going into these. No, no that's a sheesh. And, a sheesh know, scary Indiana things, Jones. right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why, you know, people want to eat adventure travel. That's, you know, they get scared of that. But it really is for everybody. There is something for everybody uh, for adventure travel. And adventure travel really is, you know, just exploring new cultures, new, you know, lands, seeing some new beautiful jungles and coastal. It really is for everybody. So it is growing. And I feel like a lot of people now are you know, trying to do an aspect of adventure travel in their year of travel, or maybe they'll do, you know, a nice relaxing one, but they always try to have some kind of uh, adventure travel incorporated in there, which is great. Um, with Exodus, our, um, we have a great dynamics of people. I love it. Um, on my Vietnam trip, we had people from 44 to 72. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but again, like I said, our average age is about 62-ish or so. Um, and 50% of our travelers are solo. We have a lot of solo oh, okay. travelers. Yeah. And 60% are women. So we have that's a lot of more interesting, female yeah. solo travelers. That's yeah, great. Yeah. So I do love that. Um, you know, just speaking to some of our solo travelers, maybe they're 
you know, their husbands probably are working or did just don't want to travel and they are not sitting back. They want to go. And what we do is we usually would pair them with another female traveler in the same room. There's no supplement or they can get their own room for a very reasonable supplement on all of our trips. And you know what? I have been on trips with, oh, at least four solo traveler women. And by the time the trip is done, they are best friends. They are like, they're, they're planning a trip again for the following year together. And, you know, it's amazing to see how that first night when you have these solo travelers, everybody's so quiet, but by the like third or fourth day, everybody's best friends. Of so course, it's really yeah. great for solo travelers. How, that how, are large are these and, how large are these groups generally for your company? Our groups are only 16. Very okay. small. Yeah. 16 groups. So it's, it's a great average is about 14, but we do sell only a max of 16. So like I said, everybody eats together. We got one large table, nobody segregated, um, but we do have the flexibility if we've had couples that have said, you know, we're going to go eat and find our own place. Totally fine. Like we're not, you're not uh, strict to eat with us, but that's why I think solo travelers with us is such a great um, program because they're not left by themselves. And Fantastic. it's always welcoming and it's, it's great. Now yeah. let me turn to Ryan. Uh, uh, first of all, do you, have, do you guys have any idea of how large the, the market is for adventure travel? Uh, uh, and really more importantly, who are your guests and, and what's the profile and, and, you know. Yeah. From a, how large it is. I mean, it's, it's growing on our side, James. Um, we're, we're starting to see a lot more chatter about it inside of, from our product team and from our competitive uh, intelligence teams, but from a, a overall size i don't know that we've done a study um recently that, that would that i think probably a couple others might have that but from who's doing this i you know I, our, our average demographic just overall collects about 64 64 is probably our average traveler but i i would say that it probably it, we're getting down into the high fifth mid to high 50s on the ones that are built that are a little bit more adventurous i mean we're seeing quite an impact from a we're partnering with advisors on affinity groups and these 55 plus communities have been a, a, a growing affinity for us um from a group standpoint and that's where we're seeing a lot of these event folks that are seeking a little bit more adventure um in ours so i think that if you line that all up we're you know probably high 50s are the ones that are a little bit more adventurous that mm -hmm. are willing to do the costa ricas the finlands the africas the even the antarcticas we're seeing in the mid at least from our demographic, 55, 55 through the low 60s, even in the mid 60s. Are you seeing, as Wendy mentioned, more solo? I, it's I, that's a, a, it's funny she brings that up because it's it's a topic of conversation for us uh, constantly. I mean, we have quite a few um, single supplements, um, and we tend to contract in our smaller group travel about three to you know we will contract three to four single supplements on our regular size. We try and get anywhere from three to six, but th that is a growing segment in the marketplace is the solo traveler. And uh, I think it's something that, that we're going to see grow over the next couple of years as well. And we're, we're planning for it at Colette. Uh, let me shift over to Ashish. Uh, first of all, any idea of the size of the market? I know you've, you, you participate in WTTC and I'm sure other ITTA and other than that. And then what, who is your client? What is the demographic? Yeah, so, so I actually have some stats for you here. Um, oh, there you go. Now, we, now I got somebody came with them. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, exactly. But, I mean, I, I, yeah, he looked uh, it up while I, like I did. <laughs> <laughs> Google Busted, is amazing, no. isn't it? <laughs> Busted. No, no, I actually, this was, this was a topic of conversation in Rwanda, but Jane knows me really well. <laughs> Uh, it was a topic of conversation uh, in Rwanda, WTTC. It's been a topic of conversation at USGOA. We've also opened opened this topic just uh, among adventure companies, right? We, we travel together. And so it, it's about just north of 300 billion right now globally. Wow. And it's going to be it's going to be growing by 15 to 20 percent every year. The, the, the stat that we should pay more, pay more attention to than the number, the market number, because what that proves is that there's enough for everybody. We don't have to have protectionism or anything like that. We, there's enough for everybody. I mean, mm -hmm. there's nobody in this space that can say we control more than 2% of the market. Right. Um, I don't care who the biggest company is, right? It's just, there's no way. And this is, you know, I, I used to work for a finance company that had a trillion dollars in house. So th this is this is the case. However, the stat that we should be paying attention to is the number of jobs. Currently, and, and the pandemic laid this bare, and we've worked with different tourist boards on this. Uh, currently, one in 10 jobs globally come from travel. 
and specifically adventure sustainable travel. Mm -hmm. And you could see it, the poorest countries in the world, the countries that actually handle tourism the best, the ones that understood this the best, the countries that didn't aggregately calculate this properly are the ones that didn't see the effects that it was having on tourism until this happened. Case in point, take three countries, take Ecuador, take Kenya, and take, I think I had Colombia in there as well. I tracked these three countries, unemployment rates, Ecuador, Pre-pandemic, March 2020 was 12.5% unemployment. By June was 62%. Kenya was 21% unemployment by March 2020. By June was near 70%. Right. You, you start seeing all these stats that apply here. So the figure we should be paying attention to is not so much the revenue figure, but the number of jobs. Because WTTC, WTTC says that by the end of the decade, and we're still on track for this, tourism will account for one in six jobs. Right now it's one in 10. Wow. So that's the first thing. Uh, in terms of our demographic, it's 45 to 65, mainly couples and, 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 and families. 30% of our business is families with two interesting stats there. One is called gramping. Um, somehow the parents become the stepchildren that get left behind. So it's, it's the grandkids and the grandparents that decide to go on a vacation. And it's because this is their legacy. It's not trust funds. It's this. The second part of it that we found interesting is among the couples that are going, our adventure trips in many cases are mea culpas from one spouse to another because the spouse has been is a C-level executive has been traveling nonstop and wants to do something really, really crazy uh, and, and something that is just off the beaten track for the spouse as a mea culpa for being gone so much. Okay. Uh, look, I'm, I'm taking my kids to Egypt, my wife to Egypt for spring break as my own meal culpa for being gone 200 days out of the year. So that tells you something right there. So this is our clients do the exact same thing. Uh, uh, and, I, and I suspect it's the same for a lot of companies, but I, we just asked, but that meal culpa part is what got my attention. Yeah. So, 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 so your, uh, your dad doesn't take your kids and, and let you go off alone. He's tr he's tried. The problem is I've gotten them so used to ATVs and adventure. He goes, forget it. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> there is there is a gap there too but i'm looking yep. at <laughs> yep. uh, uh jane uh sort of the any idea about the size of the market since you you said you were looking it up uh oh well i i, I he, he did much better job than i I did. Okay. Um, yeah. He knows how to search better. And then the demographic, the demographic of your clients as well. So, you know what? I don't deal with consumers as, right. as much, so I'm not going to know those numbers. It is really anywhere from 18 to 75. I'd say the majority of our travelers are 45 to 70. Okay. Uh, simply because when you're going long haul, you got to have the money to pay for the tickets. Got it. Got it. And, and get there. And Simon, uh, in terms of what you offer, uh, what a do you have an estimate of the size, and also what is the demographic of your uh, your customer? In, in regards to how large it is, I'm going with what Ashish said because that was brilliant. So we stick with that. But uh, in in terms of the travelers. Um, Again, it's not a huge kind of market for us at the moment, but we've just definitely seen the increase. Uh, Multi-gem families, um, honeymooners now that are going that want to add a little bit of adventure into to sort of their trip. So I say the, the, the age range uh, goes anywhere from the kind of early 30s up until kind of, again, the, the, the high 50s, 60s. But uh, definitely one of the fastest growing sort of um, bits within our, with, within our booking engine. No, that's great. Uh, I'm going to combine the last two questions because we're kind of running out of time here. Uh, but uh, first of all, what uh, give us some idea of the resources you have for advisors who are seeking to sell adventure travel, and then just give us a contact point, URL, whatever you can uh, for for your your company. I'm going to start with uh, you, Wendy. Yeah, so we love working with our advisors. Actually, forty percent of our travel um, comes from advisors. So we love it. We're land only. So we need advisors to help to get our travelers and clients to the starting destination. So we are really wanting to work and help. So what we do is we do webinars twice a month, mm -hmm. um, usually on destinations or styles of travel, um, just to let you know a little bit about where we go and how we do it. Um, we also offer fans, of course, as well for agents to go with us, which is wonderful. And, uh, you know, we we work with agents as well if they want to do like private groups. We offer private groups. So sometimes I'll have an agent that want to take a woman's group or, you know, they want to just do their own kind of um, group from their area or cycling okay. group or something like that. So we can do that as well. Um, and we have our own agent portal, which is great. So it allows you to hold an option for one week um, without payment, which is a really great option for people that are just kind of looking and dibbling and dabbling. So it allows you 
as an agent to send an invoice. And uh, we, we definitely help you with that as well. Um, to get any uh, information from us, you can just email us at agents at exodustravels.com. Uh, um, that is a great reference. It'll go directly to our BDM mailbox. And depending on your BDM, um, they'll action it for you. We are available as well to do webinar trainings like today. Um, now in person, back with doing in person, which is really great trainings as well. So we want to work with the agent to help them seal the deal as well, you know, um, I, I used to be an agent. I know what it's like to have the support background um, with you when you need help. You need somebody there. So we are there to help you as much as we can. Fantastic. And uh, Jane, in, in terms of uh, resources and, and where we can get a hold of you. Sure. Um, resources. We have Jenna Farber on my team. She's out of Canada. She's in charge of our Africa portfolio. We have Anna Kammerer. She's actually in Buenos Aires, but is in the U.S. a lot and always available by a phone. She's in charge of our Latin America um, for Iceland, Europe, um, Guyana, Sierra Leone. Contact me. And, and we have a whole series of webinars that we do, and we have them all online. We've got a library of webinars. We are happy to come to your office. And then in March, we, are, we have an Emerging Destinations Roadshow we are going to be in Southern California and then in the Northeast. And, you know, just pop me an email to jane at emergingdestinations.com and we'll send you dates. And if y'all are able to come, we'd love to see people. But we're here to help you sell. That is that is that is what we do and to be a resource for you. Fantastic. And uh, Ashish, uh, in terms of resources and contact points for uh, Big Five. Well, we've actually, we, we've got really cutting edge in how we do some of this stuff. So, uh, and James, you've been a large part of it, actually, as a matter of fact. So one of the recent ones, we actually have partnered up with Approach Guides. And so any advisor can now can co-brand our entire website on demand down to a specific tour, to a blog, to a video, to the whole site. It can be co-branded. And I tested it out at, at the recent Virtuoso Forum. And in nine minutes, it was done. We were able to co-brand the entire site in nine minutes. Uh, I was saying the advice. That was the first thing. The second thing is we generate our own video content in-house. Um, yeah. So any of our video content is available for any advisor to use uh, MP4 format or YouTube. Um, so that part's there. The last one is something that, James, you and I launched just before the pandemic. I, you helped us launch this. And then we relaunched it after the pandemic. It's something called Give 5.0. Right. This conversation about sustainability and, you know, getting advisors to start where they are. So we developed an, an AI algorithm called GIMP 5.0. It's essentially what happens is we tie the U.S. Sustainable Development Goals. And as travelers are going with us, we use an algorithm to help predict based on the Sustainable Development Goal, which of our projects is the right fit for the country they're visiting. So. And you could be taking a gorilla trek in Uganda and your trip is supporting a women's micro entrepreneurship project in Peru. Or you could be traveling and, you know, rappelling in Sri Lanka and your trip is supporting a clean water project in Guatemala, for example. So halfway through the trip, we're, we're getting a, a, a advisors engaged by sending them updates saying your trip supports this project as part of our Give 5.0 update. Uh, and, and it's essentially that. So those are the three main things. And then, of course, we do webinars. And I just wanted to... And I've known Jane a long time, and I got to tell you, her she's amazing as a resource. Um, I'm not plugging this because she's paying me. I'll collect payment later, Jane. Don't yeah. worry. <laughs> uh, but but it is it, it is something that if her you owe me a bribe, so that's all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I owe I owe everybody, I guess. <laughs> but I just I needed to make sure I point that out because I've, I've had several advisors, many actually more than several, come up to me and just say, I, I heard from you, I heard about you guys from Jane, and and whenever I pick up the phone with with the companies that Jane represents, I've never had a case where she hasn't answered the phone, which is great. Fantastic. And your URL is just big five at uh, your big five. Big five dot com. B I G F I V E dot com. I'm glad you spelled it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we, you know, it's funny because we keep handling HR calls for big five sporting goods and whoever's doing their, <laughs> whoever, whoever's handling them. I got to tell you, they're, they're not very happy. I'm just gonna tell no, I, I, I don't think you're good. Maybe you have a, a side business there. You got to get into Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Ryan, again, the question uh, in terms of the resources Colette has and, and the contact points. Uh, resources. I mean, we have uh, 40 BDMs in the U S five in Canada, seven in, um, Seven in Australia, I think that would be the number one resource um, to get there. Uh, our website's gocollette.com, where twofold you can find your BDM or we can help put you two together. Uh, we also have a My Colette, which is an administrative tool 
for all advisors, which gives them everything from what their bookings are, what their current commissions are, product. Um, but and also we have coming on in the next month or two a new LMS on that my Colette that can help them drive down into topics like adventure travel with Colette. So I think uh, BDMs and the website are probably their two primary resources for us. Fantastic. And uh, close it out, Simon. Uh, what, what are the resources you have and, and where can we reach you guys? Yeah, we offer quite a few fans throughout the year, normally two per quarter um, and uh, webinars as well uh, that I host uh, personally myself. Uh, you can sign up on our website, which is www.ultimatejetvacations.com. Um, you can sign up and um, sign up to the agent portal, and that gives you kind of access to a vault. Within that vault, you have all hotels, images, white label documents that are easy to kind of utilize um, that the agent can do themselves. Um, and uh, yeah, we have a strong marketing team too. So if there's any kind of thing that you the agents need sort of assistance uh, with on the marketing front, we help there too. So yeah, first thing first, I'd say sign up on our website and then you'll have access to all of that. Fantastic. Listen, I want to thank all of you for participating in today's uh, panel. And of course, if you want to find out more about these companies, one way you can do that is to go down on our uh, uh, virtual trade show floor and they all have booths down there. Uh, and you can talk to them there. And then, of course, you can con connect with them directly. Uh, again, I hope uh, this, this helped you give, give you a little idea of what's out there in terms of adventure travel and selling tours. And uh, we have other panels and we have even more in the show. So, again, uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you for, for being here. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much for having thank us. You. Thank you. Thanks, James. Love to see you guys. I'm James Schillinglaw for Virtual road shows, selling adventure and expedition travel, and please head down to the trade show floor now.